uh, lecturer will be uh, Dr. Dr. David Shi. Uh, he's a professor at the Rutgers. I think uh, David did a PhD in 2006 at Princeton, I think. Mm -hmm. And then since then, he has been working on uh, many different areas of particle physics, including string theory, a formal model building, uh, collider physics. Now, uh, he has wrote several interesting papers on the B anomalies. And then now he has been actually spending his, some of his time on the machine learning for the past few years. So, okay. Okay. Uh, let me first say thank you very much for the invitation to visit. I was very happy to take the opportunity um, to come here. Uh, I was looking back, uh, you know, uh, memory gets fuzzy during the pandemic, but uh, one of the last trips I took before everything shut down was, was to Korea um, to a workshop in, um, at IBS. So it's, re it's really nice to be back. Um, ah, interesting. Okay, let me start with a brief uh, outline. So this, this is going to be a lecture series on modern machine learning for energy physics. And uh, so Gregor and I are going to uh, basically um, tag team these topics. And um, um, sorry, so topic one is going to be motivations and uh, some basics. Can you all see? Am I writing big enough? OK. Um, topic two will be about classification and um, data representations. and um, architectures. Okay, um, so each of these topics is roughly gonna be two lectures. Um, topic three is going to be all about uh, generative modeling and density estimation. And topic four is going to be about anomaly detection. Okay, so both Gregor and I have lectured on these topics in various settings. Uh, and most recently I, I uh, gave four, a four part version of these lectures at the summer school uh, in the US called TASI. Um, so, so yeah, so. I hope um, these are of interest uh, to the people here. And okay, so let me start with some motivations. Oh, and I should say before we get into it, I really hope um, you will not be shy and please interrupt uh, with many, many questions. And I'm counting on that up to you to slow me down. Otherwise, uh, we'll finish these lectures like in half the time that we thought. And I don't know what we're gonna do with the rest of the time. So please, um, don't be shy. Um, okay, so motivations or why you should care about machine learning. Um, so I can give a little personal uh, motivation, maybe your personal story. So um, as Casey mentioned, when I was a student, um, I actually worked on formal topics and uh, string theory. Um, and then in 2009, um, that's when I switched over to work on more uh, phenomenology topics. And I started with uh, SUSY model building and SUSY breaking. Um, and what's special about 2009? Is anyone, you're all too young, uh, Young one is excluded, but you're all too young to even know what's special about 2009. Like Harry Potter came out? No, so, uh, something. What's special about 2009? Why would I switch from doing black holes and all that stuff to phenomenology in 2009? What's that? 
Oh yeah, the, the financial crash, yeah, no. Yeah. So 2009 is roughly when the LHC was supposed to turn on. Like that was the beginning of the LHC. So in 2009, the LHC was turning on and then there was this thing with the magnets exploding which then delayed them by a year. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so 2009, 2010, that's when the LHC was turning on. Um, and it was a very exciting time. Um, everybody was, uh, was thinking that, oh, the moment the LHC turns on, we would just discover new physics, like, right away. And, uh, you know, there'd be a Gluino at a TEV, and it would just, like, poke us in the eye. Um, and there would be, like, no backgrounds to worry about. That would be, like, trivial. Uh, there'd just be signal, signal, signal. Um, so, so everyone expected uh, new physics almost immediately. And I remember I was at uh, IAS, uh, Prince, the other IAS uh, in Princeton, and uh, you know, there, was, there was a summer school there at the time, and even the old faculty like Ed Witten got their laptops out trying to learn how to run Pythia, because they wanted to um, be part of the big discoveries that were gonna happen. Okay, so everyone thought new physics was right around the corner, and um, well, here we are, uh, what is it? 13 years later, right? Um, so 2022, uh, so safe to say that uh, things didn't turn out as expected. Okay, we did discover the Higgs, big achievement. Um, uh, so the standard model is complete. But uh, it's safe to say that sort of these big predictions for what else the LHC would discover, like supersymmetry or you know, large extra dimensions or um, WIMP dark matter, um, none, of these, none of these predictions have so far uh, turned out, panned out, right? So things did not uh, turn out as expected and um, uh, sort of the big top down, well-motivated, Uh, predictions uh, not found yet. So, yeah, so that's not just supersymmetry, um, but you know, uh, also, uh, so that's not just limited to the LHC, I would say. Um, so, extra dimensions, so like RS, for instance. Um, but yeah, so it's not just limited to the LHC, but also in the direct search for dark matter, right? So WIMPs, I think um, Lux, or no, sorry, LZ just released uh, their latest result this past week, right? And it was a limit that was roughly, what, like two times stronger than the previous limit, I think? So, so again, so the search for dark matter, we were supposed to discover WIMPs, that also hasn't panned out. And if you go back further in time, um, there was like, you know, so basically, you know, not, none of the big predictions since the 70s have panned out, right? So what about uh, grand unified theories as another uh, thing that hasn't panned out, right? So we, we were supposed to see proton decay already in the 70s, and Howard Georgia was supposed to collect his Nobel Prize, so that hasn't panned out um, either. Um, good, so, so despite being a theorist um, and having come from a very formal background, I think I will be the first to say that the predictions of theorists have not been very um, solid or successful um, uh, for, for many decades now. Okay, so, so what do we do with this? So we've looked for the well-motivated stuff. And we've come up empty. So I think um, different people have reacted to this uh, or, or decided what to do with this um, in different ways. And I think there's, so they're, they're all very valid and interesting uh, ways to go. Okay, so, so what, what next? Um, well, you could do more model building. You can try to explain why 
we haven't seen what we've seen while still trying to solve the same problems that you know, all these things were invented to solve. Okay? You could figure out ways to hide the new physics um, at our current experiments or to say why they shouldn't have shown up yet. So definitely that has been a fruitful uh, direction. Um, another thing you can do is to say, well, maybe the way we've been looking for these at the LHC or at the big uh, direct detection experiments, that we're not looking in the right place, so let's build uh, new experiments or let's propose uh, new experiments. So that's been a very active uh, direction, right, as you know, um, proposing tabletop experiments or thinking of cool condensed matter uh, tricks or uh, quantum sensing tricks to, to detect uh, alternative um, uh, types of dark matter, for instance, that aren't the usual kind. Um, so yeah, new experiments. Um, and then the third thing, which is going to be uh, motivating these lectures is trying to get more out of existing data. Okay, we have these big data sets, like the LHC data set, and we've looked in some particular places for the new physics, um, and we haven't found it there, but you know, what if the new physics is hiding in the data, but we haven't um, looked in the right place. Looked in the right place. Okay, and that's extremely possible uh, because of how big and complicated this data is. Right? So if the data was very simple and you know, just a small data set with not a lot of particles or whatever, not a lot of correlations, not a lot of features, then presumably we would have noticed if something was off. But in fact, the data is very complicated and we can't even record it all, right? We have to trigger on things. So it's possible that it could be being generated uh, at the LHC and we just haven't uh, looked in the right place yet. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so rather than following some top-down uh, motivations, uh, what this approach is uh, enabled uh, by this modern machine learning that we're going to be uh, learning about in these lectures, uh, what this approach, I would say, is more bottom-up. It's more data-driven. And it's just following, it's following the data. Okay, so it's following the data instead of following the, the top-down um, ideas, yeah? So maybe the data itself, we could find the anomalies in the data and we could uh, find the new physics where it is. That's the dream, okay? And for me, this is, uh, for me, this is the main motivation, what I've just described here in this uh, evolution um, from the big hopes to our current status. That, for me, is the main motivation that I'm so interested in uh, machine learning for HEP. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to see if there's any way it could be fit into. Yeah. So characterizing. Well, you, yeah. Okay. You could say it's it's getting more out of existing data in a different way um, because uh, rather than doing direct searches. Um, you know, we, we, can, we can take the existing data, including all the null results, um, and we can um, fit and see, you know, what we can learn about uh, physics beyond the standard model that way. So I think, yeah, so this could also be um, DSP. Okay. Yes, another question in the back. Yeah, so that, good. So getting more out of existing data, as I'll m mention in a bit, uh, can, be, can come in two ways, yeah, at least. Yeah, so one is supercharging existing searches to get more sensitivity out of the things we already do. Something machine learning 
is very helpful at. And the other is to look in unexpected places or look everywhere. Um, I should say there's a lot of sort of echoes and overlap between what Ben was talking about and what we'll be lecturing about here. Uh, so maybe that the colloquium that Ben gave um, went by fast. So you can think of the rest of these lectures as we'll all try to understand what, what Ben was trying to tell us um, now over the next eight lectures. Okay, so yeah, so he also mentioned the same point, I think, that maybe we could try to uh, come up with ways that we could look more broadly or look everywhere uh, to see if the new physics could be in some unexpected place. Yeah. Yeah, so following the data means uh, listening to the data is what is the data telling us? Is there a way to look for the anomalies in the data um, without, without like designing a search to look for the gluina or something? Can we just, yeah, and machine learning, as, as you know, um, can help a lot with, with this program, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, like I said, that's the, um, for me, the, one of the, or the main motivation. I think Casey said I, in recent years I've spent some Time, some time working on machine learning. I think that's an uh, understatement. I've kind of drank the Kool-Aid, and that's pretty much all I do uh, these days. So I'm very excited about this stuff, and I hope through these lectures um, we can sh I can share that we can share that excitement with you. Um, so another motivation I think for studying uh, machine learning uh, for applications in high energy physics is honestly that ML is really cool. Okay, so I mean this is like science fiction stuff, right? So a lot of the things that are being developed, um, and you know they're being developed outside of our community, so that's another is, is like interdisciplinary. Um, but a lot of these things just seem like they ha they shouldn't be possible, uh, and yet and yet they are. Um, so that's going to be hopefully something you you get out of these lectures too is that ML is a very powerful new methods. And you know, being, sitting at the intersection of statistics and um, technology, you know, enabled by uh, powerful computing, uh, just things that you didn't think were possible uh, now are possible. And um, very powerful new methods and you know, being enabled by this deep learning revolution, okay, that sort of started in um, really I would say just the past decade, okay, that's how new this stuff is. Um, that's the other I think really exciting thing about this topic is how new everything is. I can say having worked on this other stuff like Susie, it was so hard to get new ideas like it, it, people have been studying that stuff for decades already, very smart people. Uh, have been studying that stuff for decades, so pretty much every last drop of uh, creativity had been squeezed out of that. Uh, and it was very hard to get anything new. Whereas here, everything is less than 10 years old uh, pr for the most part. So, you know, it's, there's just so many new things you can do. Um, the sky is really the limit. So, the deep learning revolution in the 2010s, you may have heard with um, image classification. Uh, natural language processing, uh, the, all the text stuff, right? Uh, games. I know Go is very popular uh, here, so I don't know if people were devastated when or excited when uh, the AI learned how to play Go. Um, but yeah, so all this revolutionary stuff. Uh, just last week, I think Google, a team of ex-physicists actually at Google, um, designed the natural language processing. Um, uh, our network train, trained it to write LaTeX and uh, also to solve, so you can type in like uh, what is you know, the solution to 4x plus 6 equals 0 and it will tell you the answer in LaTeX. Um, so it can solve sort of high school math problems um, in, given in sort of a natural language form. Uh, so yeah, so there's all these remarkable breakthroughs and um, these are uh, waiting to be applied to high energy physics. 
Okay. Um, and I can say from personal experience, you know, several papers of mine uh, that uh, in the last few years that have been fairly successful, I would say, literally started with Googling, like, how can I do this uh, with machine learning? And then out pops autoencoders. Oh, what's an autoencoder? Um, so, you know, you can really write a paper, a nice paper, just by searching for something on Google. Um, no joke. Okay, so, so there's just all these powerful new techniques that, uh, when applied to high energy physics, can give us lots of uh, benefits. And so, for instance, as we mentioned, uh, this can involve uh, supercharging existing methods. And I think um, we're going to see many examples of this with classification. So one of the prime examples of this is classification. And the example that we'll be focusing on in these lectures is uh, top tagging, so classifying boosted top quarks against the QCD background. That's a very nice uh, benchmark um, you know, uh, application. Uh, and you're, we're going to see how modern machine learning uh, can really uh, boost the performance of that a lot. Um, OK. And uh, so we can supercharge the existing methods and achieve, in some cases, we can even show that we can achieve near optimal performance. Okay, in the, some cases where you can quantify that, um, you can show that you can achieve near optimal performance. Um, and the other way that machine learning, uh, these revolutionary new ideas and techniques can help is they can enable, I would say, qualitatively new kinds of analyses. And I guess, yeah, to me, well, both are exciting, but this is, this is really exciting, I think. So now we can do qualitatively new things. Uh, and here's really where I think the sky is the limit. We can, you, you know, there's a lot of things you can imagine doing now uh, that you couldn't do before. Um, and so especially with uh, anomaly detection, um, you're going to hopefully uh, see uh, some examples of that, where they're just like really qualitatively new things uh, that you can do. Um, new kinds of ways to search for new physics uh, that we couldn't uh, do before, or even imagine before. OK. So let's see. What else do I want to say? Um, good. So we have these powerful new ideas, techniques being developed partly um, you know, outside our field, but also increasingly uh, inside our field. Um, and uh, we have the data, right? So. So the other piece of this um, story is the big data. Yes. So for sure. So I'm only aware of uh, well now two papers that uh, apply RL to anything in our field. One is uh, they tried to do some uh, jet grooming. Uh, using re reinforcement learning. Uh, and the other I just heard about two weeks ago uh, in Mainz, um, which is a paper by Matt Schwartz and his uh, group at um, Harvard, where they were trying to apply re reinforcement learning to, actually it's a, more of a formal application to like simplify. They, I think the elevator pitch would be, can I replace Mathematica's full simplify with some deep learning approach? Uh, and they, they, um, they, they tried out a reinforcement learning based approach, and specifically to simplify poly logarithm identities. So as a very sort of proof of concept toy, a limited, well, it's something they're actually interested in, I think. So, so that's the only two I'm aware of. Um, I think it's not, yeah, if it was immediately obvious how to apply that to our field, there would be a lot more papers on it. So no one's cracked that nut yet, but uh, maybe, uh, you know, Gregor has another example in mind. Yeah. Uh, good, good. So um, that I'm much less aware of, but there there are papers like doing active uh, accelerator control. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um,
Good, okay. Anyone else with a question or comment? Okay, so the other ingredient here that I want to emphasize is that you know, all of this is possible because, again, enabled by technology, computing, uh, just the way that experiments in our field has gone. Uh, there are a lot of different avenues now for, for big data sets uh, where uh, these methods can, can gain a lot, right? So um, there's the LHC, but one thing that I'm personally very interested in, uh, I think is a promising direction, is to look beyond the LHC, and especially at astronomy and cosmology, there are very big data sets that are even public. Um, any one of us can download and analyze in principle. So uh, we, can, we can play at being uh, experimentalists, right? So there's Gaia, which I've uh, worked with quite a lot, and you'll hear a seminar by Sunghak, I think, later in the week uh, about something we're doing with the Gaia data. Um, there's other big data sets. I think LIGO is also a good target for machine learning. There's pulsar timing arrays. Um, there's this big uh, galaxy survey, LSST, that's going to come online um, next year, supposedly. So yeah, and the list, of course, is going to go on. Um, all of these are extremely ripe, ripe targets, I think, for the machine learning techniques that we're going to talk about. Yes? Good, good. Okay. So even, even we don't know what's background. Yeah. And everything might come up, so why don't you talk about Okay, that's my next point. That's my next point. Thank you. So, well, not specifically about, uh, yeah, so I guess, yeah, that's sort of my next point, which is that um, in high energy physics, especially the LHC, uh, it's sort of an ideal setting for machine learning applications. Because if you compare to other cases like biology, medicine, uh, economics, sociology, you know, where you deal with people and there's like privacy laws and, and we don't understand people, uh, so the data is messy, noisy, limited. Uh, here, um, especially at the LHC, as uh, Myung Hong was saying, um, we understand the standard model and we understand our uh, detector. Right? We can model things extremely precisely compared to other fields. So we have very accurate and relatively uh, inexpensive simulations. And um, those simulations can sometimes be applied directly to help with the real data analysis, but also more often they can be used for designing proof of concept or toy studies of the sort that theorists you know, might do. Uh, but because of how good our simulations are, um, we can be assured that when we do one of these toy studies, uh, the results will be relevant uh, and interesting and generally correct. So that's a real luxury that we have, um, that going beyond uh, our field or beyond the LHC, uh, you, you may lose, yeah. So, so that makes it a, a very nice playground, I think. Um, so yeah. Um, so yeah, this lets us uh, prototype, uh, develop new methods, okay? And um, also you could hope, you know, to understand, and I, I think, you know, this is an active area with, you know, lots of results still to come, I think, but we could hope to understand uh, what the machine learned if that's you know, of interest to people. So given that we know the truth level of the simulation, um, we could hope if we train this black box machine learning thing on it, uh, we could go back and open the black box and understand what the machine learned. Okay, so, so yeah, so I think having the big data, um, uh, big data sets and the very accurate simulations, um, at least in the case of LHC, uh, is extremely beneficial. Um, and going beyond the LHC, you know, in the work we do with Gaia data, for instance, there the data-driven approaches or the simulation independent approaches are e extra valuable then. So, so that's sort of been a, a thrust of um, a lot of my research uh, with the Gaia data, for instance. Um, okay, so and in fact, the fact that 
our field is a good setting for machine learning uh, is not a new thing, okay? So there's a long history of ML in high energy physics. Oh, is there a question from Zoom? Yeah. Oh yeah, I didn't mean to say that LHC was accessible. That's why I mentioned all the other ones. Uh, the LHC is the one that's not accessible and um, the, the open data, at least at CMS, is starting to become a thing. But it's, I would say it's progressing rather slowly uh, and very limited things are publicly available. Yeah, and not a lot of groups, I think, are, are analyzing that outside of CMS itself, yeah. I have not heard personally, maybe Gregor's the one CMS person. Are there any other CMS or Atlas people in the room? I don't know. Uh, Gregor could be the spokesperson for the whole experiment here. I don't, I don't know. And that's all from CMS's side. I'm not aware of anything from Atlas's uh, side. This, this was a point statement for ah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so, yeah, so good. So there's been a long history of machine learning in high energy physics um, that we shouldn't, um, that we should remember. So, uh, so our field was an early adopter of neural networks and uh, boosted decision trees and other machine learning techniques um, in the 80s and 90s even. And I think that would qualify as part of the AI winter when sort of the rest of the community or the rest of the world was sort of not that interested in uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, because it had kind of overpromised previously. But um, in, our, in our field, people were doing, um, at the Tevatron, you know, people were doing tracking and triggering, and th there was even a D0 measurement of the top mass that used neural networks. Uh, and then B-tagging is a big thing. So all, a lot of this, these developments um, were already happening uh, many years ago. Okay, so that's all to say that none of this is, should be viewed as too um, uh, unconventional. So it, it could also be viewed as a natural continuation of um, you know, stuff that we've been doing in our field uh, um, you know, for, for a long time now. Okay, but maybe what, what is new uh, sociologically um, now is all the things that I've described sort of going back many decades were traditionally the province of uh, experimentalists, okay? And um, so increasingly, uh, not just experimentalists doing this. Actually, I meant to poll the audience because I have no idea. Are you all theorists? How many people are theorists or would consider yourself theorists? And how many are experimentalists? Two. Okay. Okay, good. So it's like the audience I had at uh, Tassi, too. So increasingly, this is not just a, a question that sometimes we'll get is why are you doing this? Like, isn't this what experimentalists do? Uh, so increasingly, it's not just experimentalists doing this. Um, and uh, a role for theorists, 
do, so we can do proof of concept. We can do maybe more out of the box thinking. And practically, you know, we don't have to go to as many meetings as Atlas and CMS people do, right? So, uh, so we're less busy, right? Just kind of joking, right? But we have, uh, but maybe, you know, we, we don't have to do as much real data analysis and all the service work and hardware and all those other things that go along with being an experimentalist. So we're free to dream and uh, think about things, um, uh, you know, so, so maybe that's um, um, something we, we have to offer. And finally, you know, uh, it's not just LHC. So we can also, despite being theorists, uh, we are free to analyze uh, open data sets. Okay? And uh, in fact, there have been quite a few successful examples of supposedly, you know, theorists analyzing um, public data and getting things out of them, especially in Astro, I'm thinking of like the Fermi bubbles, for instance, um, uh, and Tracy's work. Uh, so, you know, there's been, there are examples of theorists analyzing open data and getting stuff from that that the experimentalists um, did not. Okay, so, you know, this is the last thing I'm gonna say about motivations, and so the, perhaps the most provocative or the most um, uh, speculative thing I'll say is, you know, maybe with the advent of machine learning and all this computing and these big data sets, what we're witnessing, like who said there have to be just these two categories of physicists, theorists, and experimentalists? So maybe we're witnessing uh, sort of the creation of a new kind of physicist. Uh, that's sort of in between these two categories, okay? And I don't know what you would call it, but somebody who is, works with the data and has a different skill set, like maybe it's what people call data scientists or data science. So people who are good with the data. Um, uh, so maybe, maybe we could be called dataists. Um, I don't know if that's going to catch on. But okay. So, so yeah, so I think um, if, if you're wondering, oh, should I work on this because I'm a theorist, um, you know, don't constrain yourself by such narrow categories. Okay, yes. Yes. Great. I didn't pay attention to who raised their hand in Zoom, but yeah, okay. <laughs> Good. All right, uh, so that's the rather lengthy uh, motivation, motivational speech. Uh, does anyone have any comments or questions on that? Yes, Gregor. That's right, why, why can't they just come and put us out of uh, business completely, right? Um, well, uh, so, I have an answer to that. Do you want, are you asking me or are you asking the audience? Well, I mean, tenure? Tenure? Yeah. No, what, what do you, oh, you mean that they don't have tenure? What? No, they can't carry. Ah, uh, yeah, they can't put us out of business because we're stuck here. Yeah, no, no. Um, no, but so what, what is it that we have to offer that they don't, right? Uh, obviously, I think the answer for me and also from experience, um, like from LHC Olympics and the few CS people that did try to participate, uh, so I think Gregor already knows what I'm going to say. You're just asking it uh, to start a discussion. But what I would answer, what most people would say, is that you know the CS people don't know physics, right? So domain knowledge, that's what we call it. So um, they, they, of course, develop these powerful tools uh, for their own interesting applications. Um, but how those would apply to our problems, you know, that's something only we uh, know. I mean, they could learn that stuff if they wanted to, but I think it's probably too large of a hill to climb. So, so in fact, yeah, uh, hopefully increasingly going forward, we'll see more collaborations between people in our field and people in CS. Uh, that would be really the, the best sort of synergy, uh, people that can innovate these new techniques uh, that are trained to do that and people that know the physics uh, work together. That would be, I think, ideal.
Um, but yeah. Okay, good. So, all right, so that's, that's enough motivation. Hope you're all sold on why we're here. Um, now let's talk about the basics. Okay, so let me start. All right, what is ML? All right, so what is all this machine learning stuff? Um, I think if you want to say it nicely, you would say it's learning or extracting information from data. And if you really want to boil it down or demystify it, you I would say it's just a glorified curve fitting. Okay, that's really uh, in a like supercharged, super turbocharged. Uh, way, okay, it's very high dimensional, very high dimensional, and uh, both, so very high dimensional data, like a lot of data, also a lot of features in the data, and also the functions that we're fitting, the curves that we're fitting to the data are also very high dimensional in that they have um, many, many parameters, millions or bi even billions of parameters. Uh, Th those are the types of curves that we're fitting to the data. Okay, but at the end of the day, that's what we're doing. We have some data, we have a task that we predefine in advance, and we wanna fit some function to optimize uh, for that task. Okay, so let's say what the form of our data is. So we have some data, let's say xi is the data, and it's some um, d-dimensional real-valued vector, okay? So this d uh, is the, the number of features in the data, and this i runs from one to n, or n data, which is the number of instances uh, you have in the data. So again, LHC is a good, Example to keep in your mind, here n data could be the number of events, okay? And d, the, or sorry, the, the features could be, so for example, n data equals num number of events, and the features could be, so xi could be, you know, p, the pt, the eta, the phi, uh, particle one, and the PT, eta, phi, particle two, et cetera, in the event, okay? So um, another example could be uh, images, like image classification, cats and dogs, let's say. You wanna train something to distinguish pictures of cats from pictures of dogs. Um, so another example could be images. In that case, um, xi could be uh, all the pixels in the image. And uh, depending on your image, uh, so pixel, pixel intensities, let's say, or maybe RGB color, uh, you could do that too. Um, so the pixel intensities of your image, those could be your features, right? And, um, and you know, depending on the resolution of your image, let's say, what is the typical resolution these days, like a megapixel, um, right? That's a million pixels in an image. So in that case, so for example, then D could be uh, a million dimensional, okay? And, okay, so, uh, usually, we assume, you don't have to, you can go beyond this assumption, but generally, or typically, okay, what I'll say covers, I think all the examples we'll have in this course, and most of the examples you would uh, encounter uh, probably um, in your own work, but we typically assume that the events, or sorry, that the data 
instances. Uh, are IID, okay, so they're independent uh, of each other, and they're, uh, so what is IID? Independent and, uh, in, what does the other I stand for? Identical. identical, yes, independent and identically distributed uh, from some, well, from some distribution you know, and that could be the goal of your machine learning is to learn that distribution from the data. That could be an example of a goal. Um, but yeah, so they're IID drawn from some underlying uh, distribution. Okay. Uh, so that's a very important uh, assumption. And it's certainly true uh, at the LHC, right? Certainly true um, of some set of images, something. Um, it's not so clear how this assumption applies then to, say, cosmology, where maybe the data is the CMB, uh, and like the pixels in the CMB are correlated with each other. In fact, that's the whole problem, right, is to learn that. Um, so, and then we just have one data instance then, the sky, so like there's only one universe. So yeah, so th this is a rather limiting assumption, I think, if you go beyond, um, so, some of these settings, it's true. Yeah. Is, you mean, yeah, if it's like a megapixel, then it's like 10 to the three by 10 to the three, yeah? That's how we get to a million, I think, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe that's how it works. Yeah? Yeah. Should data be in the same Should what? Data space be in the same Euclidean space? Uh, RD. Um, well, okay, I, I'm oversimplifying this. It could be discrete, so it could be integer value data. Um, so those are kind of the poss two possibilities, I guess. Uh, what else could it be? I'm not saying it's a metric, there's any metric on this vector space or anything, any inner product or anything. It's just, it's real value data. Um, that's the real world, yeah. Um, okay, good. All right, so, so we want to fit a function. To fit some function, let's give it a name. Uh, and this function is a function of the data, of course. Um, and it has some parameters, theta. Okay, so these are the parameters. So think if you're fitting a line to the data, then your line has a slope uh, in an intercept, right? Two parameters. Um, and later we'll talk about neural networks that fit uh, some to the data and have, that's where you get to many, many, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of parameters. Okay, and what is the nature of the fit? So. We want to minimize some objective or loss function, okay? And so this loss function is a function of the parameters, right? That's what we want to minimize. And the way we always define it, um, because the data is IID, the default thing to do, you can mess with this assumption too, you can play, play with this, but the default thing to do is to treat every data instance the same. So they're all on the same democratic uh, footing. Uh, and then, so we have some loss function that we define in an instance by instance uh, basis, okay? And so, so we wanna minimize this thing with respect to the parameters. Okay, minimize this with respect to theta. Okay, uh, so let me give an example of that. So it's an example I'm sure you've all done before. Least squares or chi-squared fitting, yeah? So in that case, um, L 
So example, so L, so uh, uh, least squares, and uh, let me call it least square, well, okay, least squares fitting. So now um, this is an example where let's say the data has a target, okay? So what I'm trying to learn is a map from every data point to some label. Yeah, so I'd like F to uh, map every data point to some label. So these are called the labels, okay? And um, there's sort of two uh, categories of this task. If the labels are continuous, like let's say my data looks like this, so this is my x and this is my y, and maybe I'm trying to learn, trying to learn that, okay? So y is a continuous target, um, so these can also be called targets. Uh, continuous, then this is uh, referred to as regression. You could also have the labels be discrete, okay? So what's an example of a discrete label? Like cats and dogs, yeah? If I wanna classify things. So this is called classification. So discrete, for example, maybe y is equal to zero or one, so the label is either zero, say background, or one, signal, okay? That would be binary classification. And if I have many labels, zero, one, two, 10, 100, that's multi-class uh, classification. Okay, so these are two examples, or the two, the two examples of uh, this kind of um, task where we're trying to map the data to a label. And when these labels exist, I should mention this falls under the broader category of supervised machine learning, okay, or fully supervised machine learning, okay, when all the data has uh, pre predefined labels. Okay, and oh yeah, I was supposed to say what least squares fitting, right, so what is an example of a loss function that would accomplish this task? Something you, I'm sure you've all done before, but so now this is a function of this, it's also a function of the label, Okay, we could just do this, right? So it has the right property that uh, it, well, it's a positive convex or whatever, it's positive definite, right? So uh, it gets worse and worse the farther you are from the label, okay, bigger and bigger. And uh, it's zero when you, you hit it, hit the label right on, okay? So it has the right properties uh, for a loss function. And this gets a name, it's called mean squared error. It's a very common, uh, commonly used uh, loss function for uh, regression. Okay, now maybe we should pause for a minute and ask yourself when in our field, or actually in any field that deals with real data, okay, uh, or well, okay, definitely in our field, when in our field could you ever do supervised machine learning? for real. Like, do the events coming out of the LHC come with labels? Like, does every time a Higgs is produced, it says, hey, I'm a Higgs? Uh, no, right? So when could we ever do supervised machine learning? Anyone? Sorry? Yes, exactly. So, good. So it's with simulations where we have uh, truth level information about every event, that's where we can really do supervised uh, machine learning, okay? And um, uh, in the real data, right, you can't do supervised machine learning anymore. You have to do other things, okay? But you can do a lot just with simulations. You can develop really state-of-the-art top taggers, for instance, using the best simulations we have, 
And, those, and then you can go see how well they do on real data, and you say, oh, they actually match the simulations pretty well, the performance. So uh, simulations are, are quite useful and powerful still. Yes, was there a question in the back? Yeah. Good. So indeed, you can try to do what I would call semi-supervised machine learning, or maybe weekly supervised machine learning, uh, using data in control regions and signal regions. And then what you're guaranteed is that probably the data in the control region is mostly background, but you can't, in, you know, guarantee necessarily. So you can get very close to this for sure in the right setting with real data. Yeah, that's true. Good. Okay. Um, right, so what is there besides, unsuper uh, besides supervised machine learning? So um, let me write it here. So what do you do when you don't have labels? So other kinds of ML are more uh, data-driven, I would say. Um, and, you know, you can sort of classify it based on, or categorize it based on uh, how, how much label you have, right? So let's say you have no labels at all. Well, you can still do stuff with that, as we'll see in these lectures. And that is called unsupervised, un supervised machine learning, okay? You could try to do, this might be uh, the example uh, you were saying, Thomas, that uh, let's say you have control regions and signal regions, then you might, that I would call that, people would call that uh, noisy label. So you have uh, a way to label the data that is uh, somehow correlated with the label you're actually interested in, like signal or background but is not a one-to-one -one perfect correlation, but is noisy. This is a probabilistic thing. Um, and so that would be called uh, weakly supervised. Um, and then there's yet a third thing you could try to do uh, with partial labels. Let's say you try to mix data and simulation together. So you train uh, and this is often used in real-world applications where data is more limited, so they might have a, uh, they might try to label, let's say, okay, so how do you label cat and dog images? Somebody, to prepare the training data for the machine learning task, uh, you have to pay somebody to go and look at a million images of cats and dogs and label them, like, so somebody has to do it. Um, actually, that was a big, I think, in the history of uh, the deep learning revolution, that was a practical thing that some, you know, had to be solved. Uh, I think somebody had to prepare this thing called ImageNet database, which is one point something million images in a thousand different categories. And I think some professors at University of Illinois uh, had to go and pay uh, people like undergrads or maybe people on, on the internet to, um, to label all these images, uh, you know. So, um, so yeah, so creating the label data itself could be expensive in some places. And so there's, there's work that's been done with partial labels, where some of your data is labeled and the rest isn't, and there are techniques where you can try to extract the information from the label data and learn something uh, from the unlabeled data. Okay, so that goes by the name of semi-supervised uh, machine learning. Okay, um, and all these together, you could say, are less than supervised. Okay, and we'll sometimes refer to those as less than supervised uh, machine learning methods. Okay, so besides this uh, least squares fitting or regression and classification, so what are some examples of things that we try to do uh, over on this side? Um, so let me, let me give you a few examples of that. Um, so some examples of 
less than supervised. ML pass. So let's say you want to do anomaly detection without any reference to a model, okay? And just from the data. This is like following the data, right? So let's say my data looks like this, and then there's that guy there, right? Or maybe there's a few such guys like this. So your eye, your biological neural network, uh, will look at this data and be like, huh, there are some outliers here, right? So this is a form of anomaly detection. It's fully unsupervised, right? I have not made any use of any labels. Um, and this is called, this would go by the name outlier detection or um, uh, out of sample. So what we're doing, it's our implicit bias, right? Is that we say, oh, there's a cluster of things here that are like defining the sample uh, or the distribution uh, of the normal data. And then there's these outliers where something weird happened. Those are out of distribution. Yeah. Okay. And um, we heard a bit about this in Ben's uh, talk already. Um, this is something that autoencoders tried to do. We're going to have uh, lectures on that. Um, and you know, so one problem, you know, with applying this to, to uh, LHC data at least, is that apart from sort of violation of symmetries, um, you know, just from quantum mechanics, probably every part of phase space that's allowed is populated. So there's never any. There's never any place where there's zero standard model background, right? Um, and so trying to really find a place where things are really, really out of sample is, let's say, potentially misguided. Okay. But you can at least maybe still look for things that are way out on the tails of distributions and hope you know that that is meaningful. So that's that's the sense in which that could apply, um, I think, uh, to searching for new physics at the LHC. Okay, there's another form of anomaly detection. Oh, and I should say, you know, okay. So this is what uh, real world ML people, like say, I don't know, engineers at Uber trying to design self-driving cars. That's what they think of, I, I think it's safe to say, when you talk about anomaly detection. Um, they want to know, you know, something really out of, out of distribution, out of sample or out of distribution. Um, event like an elephant is crossing the road. Not supposed to happen, ever, right? So really out of distribution stuff. Um, but uh, what we're actually interested primarily in, I would say, searching for new physics is a situation that's more like this, right? So what does that indicate? Again, your eye is drawn to that, okay, which is an overdensity Overdensity with respect to what? So you have in mind some reference distribution. You know, just by eye, you're drawn to the sidebands of this, right? The surrounding of this is lower density, and then there's this big spike of uh, data here, right? So these are overdensities. So overdensity detection, let's say. And these are called collective or group anomalies. The self-driving car doesn't really care if there's one elephant or a hundred elephants crossing the road. They're all uh, out of distribution, right? Uh, but maybe actually the self-driving car does care uh, if there's more cars than usual on the road, because that would be rush hour traffic. Uh, so maybe Google cares about that. Uh, but yeah, so that's collective or group anomalies looking for overdensities in the data. That's really um, I think what we really mean uh, when we're looking for new physics. Um, okay, so I would say this is um, uh, uh, high energy physics applications. Okay, I'm, I'm painting things with a pretty broad brush here. Uh, so, yeah, okay. Mm hmm. Yeah. 
Right, so that, that's sort of the, I would say, the physics way of thinking of things. Like there's, some, there's some amplitude for everything, right, to happen. So what does it even mean to be out of distribution, right? So it would have to mean, like, with respect to some background reference sample, uh, distribution, so like the standard model. Uh, so if you have, if you've already defined in advance what your background distribution means, then you could say this is really out of distribution with respect to that. Yeah, external knowledge actually could be the, the yeah. Thing. yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah, baked into it somehow, yeah, to make it fully well defined, I would say. Yeah, is there another question? Out of, out of distribution or out of sample? Mm -hmm. If something is like very high PT? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, like there's, so right. So I would say that's definitely on the tail. So it's in, it's in the spirit, okay? Um, you know, so it's a very rare for the standard model to give you such an event with such high PT. So it's in the, definitely in the spirit. But you know, we can't just say we've discovered new physics until we've estimated the standard model background. Um, so in that sense, it's also in the spirit, yeah, right? Yeah, I, I think in our high energy physics applications, like this is the correct way to think about it, but sometimes we try to get away with this because it's easier. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Um, all right, what else can we learn um, from the data without labels? So, so yeah, anomaly detection, that's a big one. Um, but there's, there's more, okay. So let's say, so th this is one thing I think is like very science fiction-y. Um, and you know, it's not something that I could necessarily do. But let's say I have all this data. Remember, every data point is IID drawn from some distribution. And I mentioned that you could try to learn this dis distribution directly from the data. So could you learn P of X? of the data, the distribution that the data was drawn from. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, I mean, it's not a new, it's not a new um, um, subject in machine learning or statistical learning, uh, but it goes by the name of density estimation. But I would say prior to the deep learning revolution, prior to people doing everything with neural networks, the approaches to this were pretty uh, limited, you know, you might say, oh, I could try to fit this to a mixture of Gaussians. Like, everything's a Gaussian, so let me just try to fit it to some number of Gaussians and let their centers and their widths vary. Those are my fit parameters. See the best, what's the best I could do. Um, so yeah, so trying, uh, people realize that we could do this very powerfully uh, with neural networks. Um, and that's gonna be a topic of uh, later lectures. So density estimation, uh, let's say, okay, let's say we could learn this, and then if we learn it, let's say we learn it in such a way that we could sample from it. So what I mean by learning it means that if you give me a data point, I can tell you what the probability density was. That's density estimation, right? But uh, you could also imagine saying, um, if I've learned this underlying distribution, I can draw samples from it. Okay, so I can make more data following the same distribution. Okay, and that's what the topic of generative modeling is. Okay, generative modeling. So that's when people uh, like do these deep fakes, right, or celebrity faces or whatever, baby faces with that, and they fool people into thinking they're real. That's what they're doing. They've trained a generative model on a distribution of images. Uh, and then it can draw more samples from that distribution. Uh, w and the fact that those samples look real suggests or indicates that they've uh, successfully learned the, the distribution, the underlying distribution. Yeah. Uh, I am using things, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know how does that thing work and because you don't have a label there using the data. Yeah, so none of this is labeled. This is all fully unsupervised. Yeah. All we have are the, say, the celebrity faces, but it's not labeled like, you know, that's Tom Cruise and that's uh, Sandra Bullock, right? It, they're just faces, yeah. 
So, and then you can learn to generate more faces based on that. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh, lots of different ways, yeah. Okay, so for instance, uh, one big application is to, that we'll talk about is, um, uh, M, it's called surrogate modeling. So you can, you, you might want to train it on a sample of calorimeter showers. Like, Jayant, uh, Jayant is very slow. Yeah, send, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so you have a, you have, your data is like all these uh, shower images of like particles that hit the detector and, and spray more particles out, uh, energy out. Uh, so that's your data, and then you can learn the distribution of that and learn to sample from it, and you can make more showers. And those showers are now fast to make. So do, are you, do you, do you use the uh, Jian data, simulation data? Yes, oh, yeah. So then it's a simulation-based uh, inference experiment. You could imagine doing it on, no, I would not say, it, it doesn't have to be. Like, so you could imagine doing it on real data. Let's say I set up a beam of electrons and shoot it at a target, a uh, real target, and then read it out. So I can make my own Jayant based on real data this way. That's another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the data is there. It's not labeled, but you know it is the reference sample that you're training on. You need the reference sample, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm distinguishing like features and labels, yeah. The label is like if I want to learn a map from features to something, those, those that something are the labels. So if I'm not learning this map to a, this target, then I, I'm not using labels, yeah. That's the, I guess, formally what I'm talking about. Yeah, good. Yeah, so, yeah, you, you want to think of the energy and the number of tracks and all those things, not as labels, but as features, yeah. Uh, another way to say it is that uh, a label is a per event or per data instance thing, right? The features are like the, the dimension, dimensionality of the data, of the data instances, so that's another distinction. This, this label applies to the whole event. Yeah, good. Okay, so good, so that's another very important task uh, and very cool sort of science fiction thing is generative modeling, learning to sample from the data distribution. Uh, and actually, um, these two things, they seem naturally related, and in fact, we will talk about a cool uh, machine learning approach called normalizing flows that can do both, uh, that link the two together and, and learn to do both, but it's not necessary, okay? So you can do density estimation without ever learning how to sample. Uh, sampling could be intractable. And you can learn to sample from this one, is th okay, that could be sort of intuitive maybe, but the other one seems counterintuitive. You can learn to sample from the true data distribution without ever having access to what it is in a tractable way. So, so you can do generative modeling. Uh, you can learn P data, uh, can learn P data implicitly. Okay, so you, you, for a given data point, uh, the generative model might not be able to tell you what the density is, but it's learned the density in an implicit way so that it can sample from it. Okay, and so the, an example of this famous, well, something called a GAN does this, generative adversarial network, do, learns the data density implicitly. Okay, so we'll be talking about that um, in lecture three, or in the third part, third part of the lectures. Okay, um, so, so good. Right, and okay, so for all these, um, so the law, I would say the loss terms, objective functions for uh, less than supervised are, I would say also less than obvious. Okay, so it's not as simple as writing down a mean squared error anymore. Um, it's less than obvious what to do here, and uh, so we're gonna we're gonna be talking about that. Uh, so more on this later. Okay. So as you'll see, there's there can be quite a lot of cleverness going on in how you define these uh, loss terms. 
for the unsupervised learning. Okay, um, looks like I'm at the hour and 15. So I should, um, I should stop and we'll continue after lunch, I guess, right? Okay. So maybe uh, some, uh, maybe some urgent questions. Mm -hmm. So, can you apply the standard to compare to the way of course that you don't know what to do with it? I think that there is, there, there is a way of I mean, do you think it's not going on? There is what? So, in the, the, do, you, do you think it might arrive in the, in the, in the, in the some case of things? Uh, apply the generative modeling to the rare process where we are expecting to see some new physics, like uh, some tail of the distributions? Uh, yes, I think, um, you mean but as a way to look for new physics? Yeah, but I mean, if you can make uh, more samples from the data, that will be useful for the yeah. real process because we don't have uh, like a sample. Okay, so then how you're, you you're touching it? on a bunch of uh, yeah. interesting ideas, I think. So, and, and you know, yeah. I, by no means have I think people exhausted all the possibilities here. I could just mention a few things that come to mind. I think you're on the right track. So, okay. like for instance, uh, with Gregor, we had a, mm -hmm. a paper, um, two actually, so I'll mention. So one where the idea was learn the generative model of the background using sidebands. And then you can generate more background uh, and use that to dis as a way of distinguishing from uh, signal. Um, and the other thing that we, mm -hmm. another thing that we did uh, proposed, mm -hmm. which is totally nuts, is suppose you train a generative model on the data as it comes in. Mm -hmm. So online even. So every time you get a new data instance, so before you throw it away, if you could learn a generative model or update the weights of the generative model, as, as I'll explain, um, you could learn the generative model of the data itself. So then our, our, our sort of crazy idea was what if you could compress, so you don't need triggers, you don't need to record the data anymore, nothing. You could just compress all of the data into your generative model, which would fit onto you know, a thumb drive. That's the, that's the entire LHC data then. So then you could look for anomalies you know, forget about the LHC, just throw it away. We don't need it anymore. Then you could just generate like data from that generative model that follows the real data perfectly and any new physics that was in the real data would be in your generative model. So that's the sort of along those lines, I think. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? So any questions from the Zoom audience? Oh, there's one, somebody raised their hand. Uh, yes, uh, please. So uh, my question about the uh, the generative model when you just try to uh, test the drain for the simulation, like you have a reference sample and then you try to train it on the uh, gen four on it, and then you try like for example like variation out encoder, you start to generate a new uh, a new points or new events uh, from the latent space, and you just generate uh, new points. Uh, mm -hmm. But my question now, this new generated points or the generated points, uh, uh, how can I trust these points? How can I say, uh, or how can I quantify basically the uncertainties that, because we sampled this from uh, a, a, a mean distribution in the latent space, right? So that's good, basically, good. You know, how can I trust the, the new generated points? Okay, so specifically with that task, um, first of all, I should say, well, this is getting ahead of ourselves a bit, but uh, we're gonna have lectures on calorimeter emulation, uh, and there's a whole challenge that Gregor and I and Ben and others are organizing uh, exactly along those lines. So train your best VAE or GAN or flow on the reference data, sample from it, and then we're gonna come up with metrics uh, that will decide you know, which model looks the best, is the most trusted, trust, trustworthy. And some metrics that you know, have been proposed uh, before are fr ranging from you know, just look at all these histograms of the, the calorimeter showers. Just make a bunch of histograms and compare reference data to your generated. Do they look okay? You know, so that's already a by eye test. Uh, you can define, get more quantitative. You can define like histogram differences, uh, chi-squareds. And, and then there's the thing that my postdoc and I showed, uh, sort of what we call the ultimate metric would be, can you train a classifier to distinguish between generated samples and reference samples? If the classifier is maximally confused, that tells you that the two distribution, the two samples are the same. At the so you add, level. so you basically add a new classifier on top of the generative model, right? As a final metric, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That Thank you. Thank you. Ultimate metric, I think. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Sure. Um, why don't we stop here and then resume uh, in the second part of the Professor David Shi lecture. Um, okay, let's thank Professor Shi again and we resume at 1.30.